Friday, December 9th. I'm Dave Weisberger, CEO of CoinRoutes, and it's time for my weekly recap video. This week, I'm reminded of one of my favorite TV shows from the distant past called Hogan's Heroes. For those of you old enough to have watched it in reruns like I did, the story revolved around, of all places, a Nazi prison camp where the allied commander of the prisoners, Colonel Hogan, managed to continuously outsmart the inept, bumbling, but lovable uh, Colonel Klink, played by Werner Klemperer. Colonel Klink and Sergeant Schultz, his right-hand man, I guess, constantly overlooked everything that went on as Hogan and his band of heroes managed to sabotage the Nazi war effort. Funny show. But this week, when I was watching Sam Bankman-Fried's tour, and seeing how Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, reacted to him uh, on CNBC, I couldn't be helped but thinking, how are we supposed to believe that Sam Bankman-Fried is this generation's version of Colonel Clink? Is he really the bumbling, lovable guy that he's trying to represent himself on TV, or something far more sinister? Honestly, I don't see how it's anything but the latter, but hey, it's possible. The reality of the situation is that O'Leary and others looked at Sam and said, you know, this guy's brilliant, and if he's brilliant, I might want to invest in him again once this little trouble gets cleared up. Now, I have a huge problem with that, considering the trouble he's talking about was $8 billion at least of customer funds stolen from those customers. Now, whether that happened due to bumbling incompetence or bond villain level you know, Machiavellian theft, I don't know, and I guess we never will know, but my vote is on the theft. The truth of the matter is, however, the reason the cognitive dissonance with people like Mr. Wonderful exists is that Sam actually had a lot of really brilliant ideas. The fact is, he had a vision for a better financial market, a market where in the same market you could trade globally in multiple currencies and do so on a fungible basis integrated with payments and other big pieces of the financial system that are essentially blocked from most people all the while doing so while getting rid of unnecessary intermediaries. So there was something to what he wanted to do. It is also true that the market structure he invented in terms of 24-hour real-time risk, in terms of multiple asset as, a, acting as collateral on the same platform in multiple currencies, was also very desirable. The fact that he turned it off for Alameda making the whole thing break, well, that's a different story. But I can understand why there is some thought that the man was smart. But the simple fact is, he was playing everybody. We watched him tell us that being an effective altruist and donating so much to political parties and putting his name out there and spending hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even billions to do it, was all the way to pull people into his ecosystem to show that FTX is a real business. Now, we won't know for a while the actual P&L of FTX. We know there were so many good features of it. We know that a huge percentage of the professional crypto community used it for hedging. Virtually every single group that traded in crypto had money lost on FTX. That is a big deal. So where does this all leave us? Well, the honest truth of the matter is we don't know whether we're dealing with Colonel Clink or some modern-day Dr. Evil, and we won't for a while. But we need to treat it as if we're tired. Stop giving the man a mouthpiece. Stop listening. That said, probably next week I'll be talking about it again, so who the hell knows. In the meantime, what's been going on in the market and what's been going on? Well, Bitcoin is essentially within a percent of where it was last week, and so is Ethereum. So not a whole lot. Volumes are down, and I think that, that Arthur Hayes said it best in his most recent Medium post. We're sort of bumping around the bottom here, in a sense, because all the forced selling has happened. Done. The miners have sold what they need to sell. All the lenders have sold what they need to sell. And so the real question is, where is the selling going to come from? If only, where's the buying going to come from? And honestly, right now, there's not a whole lot of either, and that's why we're sitting where we are. But at this time, when crypto is seemingly so weak, what a surprise that Liz Warren and her friends are all trying to use this one more time to try to kill it. Because after all, they fear Bitcoin. They fear its ability to provoke, to, to be a, a benchmark against a profligate fiat system. We know that, and I've talked about that many times. They fear what smart contracts can do to their favorite intermediaries. Because after all, without the banks being a, a source of, the, of power in the financial system, she has no foil. So she needs them to be the cartel that they are today for her to remain in power. 
The fact of the matter is, however, when we talk about regulation, I was reminded this week of a presentation I gave in 2018 to the SEC. I showed it to colleagues today. We're going to post it back up on our website, where effectively I told them, listen, you need to have a period of time to work with the industry to create rules because securities rules don't work for digital assets. Crypto, as a digital asset, trades in multi-currencies, meaning the same asset fungibly can trade against dollars, stable coins, Bitcoin, or other currencies on the same platform globally, 24-7. There's nothing in the equity markets that ever contemplated that. The second is we need to support, because it's really important for economic freedom, self-custody. The fact is, in crypto, you don't have to self-custody if you trade on an exchange, but you can at any time, until they suspend withdrawals, of course, you can pull it back and custody your own assets. We don't want to lose that in any shape or form of the next regulation. And the third thing that's really important is you need to understand the crypto market structure is different. There are differences in terms of tick sizes and fees. There are differences in terms of fragmentation. There's differences in terms of asset prices that are dramatically different than inequities. The market is adapted. And on the derivative side, fixing, no, not fixing them, perpetual swaps has created a far more efficient way for people to get leverage uh, and trade and hedge their positions. Far more efficient than futures because it doesn't socialize losses and far more efficient than options because it doesn't require volatility. But all of that still needs to fit within a rubric of regulation. And that regulation shouldn't be something from the 30s that would strangle innovation. It should protect client assets. So people whose assets are on a platform have primary claim upon any recovery. It should establish best practices for things like best execution, for things like, like uh, manipulation, for things like disclosures of risk. If I'm investing in something that is supposedly being lent out in, in a very, very clear, coherent manner, in an over-collateralized way, that platform shouldn't be able to do an under-collateralized loan to a third party. It's basically the same thing as buying junk debt when you think you're buying AAA debt. It's a big difference. And lastly, the regulation should encourage innovation. Market structure, if you looked at U.S. equities, no one would draw up market structure the way that it is today. It just kind of evolved that way. In a new asset class, we should have the chance to evolve based upon the market and incentives. In order to do that, we need to do something. But that something is not regulation by enforcement. I will leave you with that, because regulation by enforcement, which is what Mr. Gensler is doing, is problematic. The two things that it does, first, it creates a massive selection bias. The only people who will try to enter the crypto world are people who do not respect regulation in the equity world, meaning the best players, the players most likely to understand how to market well, the players most likely to not do untoward solicitation, are the ones who are the least likely to attempt products in the crypto world. So it's, you get exactly the opposite of what you want. The second thing is it absolutely chills innovation. The people who are most capable of innovating don't because they have no clarity of what will work. At every major firm, People employ compliance and legal professionals to tell them what they can do and what they can't do. When they don't know, what's their answer? Do nothing. So as a result, innovation and the ability to bring these assets safely to people have been chilled, which is why we're in the mess that we're in today. Well, that's all for today. We'll get back to ranting again next week. Take care and stay safe out there.